Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Aberman. I am the CTO and co-founder of Aspecto. And today I want to talk with you about microservices and how not to break your API. We will do that by uh, uh, going through a microservice journey. Um, we will start off with a small amount of microservices, see how, how they grow. Um, we will find the places where it's uh, getting more complicated and how microservices are getting co uh, complex over time. Um, and we will try to look at that from the developer perspective. We will try to understand um, how can we reduce the amount of issues we're going to have in production, how we're going to avoid uh, API breaking changes, and we will review what kind of tools we have to handle the complexity and what tools we don't have where we need to come up with uh, different ideas uh, uh, to solve this, this issue. And um, I, I would like to take a second just to tell you about myself and why do I think that I can help you with, with microservices. Um, so I think in the past five or, or four years, uh, I've done a lot of microservices, uh, some of them as an employee in the company, some of them as an independent consultant who help companies break monolith to microservices or their microservices uh, scaled and uh, uh, they needed help. Um, so I got quite an experience with that, and lately I started my own startup uh, called Aspecto, who is specializing in, in microservices. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm here to talk to share my experience um, um, with you. So let's start the microservice journey, where it usually starts very very simple, right? You have a new project in your company, whether you're starting a new product or maybe you're taking your monolith and you try to break it into microservices. Um, and usually it starts very, very small. You have small amount of services, the complexity isn't high. Um, sometimes even the importance of the feature to implement, implement there is not very, very high. Um, so the start is, is very, very easy, which makes it uh, a good thing. So usually you have uh, service A communicating with service B, communicating with the database, um, B communicate with C, and maybe even you have A communicating with C. So the communication is quite simple. You don't have a lot of things to, to worry about. The start of your journey usually is simple. Everything is very, very simple to run locally. Um, understanding the bigger picture, understanding your whole architecture is something which is doable. You can very easily uh, go to a whiteboard and draw your architecture. Onboarding a new developer isn't something very, very complicated. And usually that's, that's the start. Another thing one worth mentioning is that the communication is usually syn synchronous, usually uh, uh, via HTTP, um, which is a very common way to, to start with. So after a few months, Everything looks good. You decided that uh, microservices is good, um, and now you are starting to extend it. You're starting to add more feature. Product manager asks to do more stuff in, in the microservices area. And a few months later, and you find yourself looking at this kind of a diagram. So from three services, you now have 12, and the communication between them starts to get quite complicated. And just drawing everything is not as straightforward as you as you would think. And now you start to get to feel the uh, uh, the problem with that. And as developers, we're used to have problem. We're used to see those uh, a kind of complex diagram, but we need to see that we can solve them. So let's first try to break down the problems that we have. So. I think the very first problem to think of is it's hard to understand the bigger picture now. So from two services and few arrows between them, now we have 12 and we have many arrows going in many directions. And it's our job as developers to see the whole picture. It's our job to uh, be able to imagine when the user clicks on a button in our UI, which API calls are invoked and which services are involved. And how does the flow go uh, from service to service? So that's the first issue that we need to think of. 
And the second one is I need to know which payload, what is the structure of data between services? Because if I want to test something, if I want to invoke a certain endpoint and see that it works the way I expect, I need to provide the right payload with the right data to make it work. And those two things are very, very related into API breaking changes. Because the, the, the second you lost sight on the whole picture, and you don't understand the exact payload that you need to, to send between services, this is where uh, API breaking changes are, are starting to be possible. Because if you're not sure on the bigger picture and on the payloads, you make an, a, a change there and you're not 100% sure what's going to be the impact of that. So that's a, a, an important issue that we need to overcome. And also we're starting to have some issues running everything locally. Because if I need to run my entire environment locally, that's starting to be a bit of, of, of a, a hard task to do. Um, and we need to think of that uh, uh, as well. So those are problems and we are likely to solve them. Let's, let's uh, think about it. So usually when companies are starting to think about how to show the entire diagram of, of our architecture, uh, the first immediate thought is to do like a, an architecture document that simply describes your architecture. Um, this is fine. This is quite uh, easy to do. The problem with that is usually it's not up to date after a week or two after it's done, right? Uh, um, you done it, it's updated. Now you made some changes. You're not going to update this document every time. Um, that's why it's a good thing to do because it's, like puts stuff in, 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 in perspective and how it should look or how it's kind of look, but it's not 100% accurate. The second thing that we talked about is it's hard to understand the payload and the structures between services. And here we have some tool that we can use, Swagger or OpenAPI documentation. This is a very well-known uh, uh, um, solution to document your API usage. Um, this is basically Swagger, as you can see here in the left side, you can see all of the configuration that describes your API. And here you can see the UI generated based on this configuration. So you can see uh, that we have an endpoint uh, post slash path. Um, you can see all of the parameters that should be sent in your uh, body um, with examples of everything and what is the responses you should expect. And it's very, very useful because for me as a developer, if I need to use this endpoint, now I have a place that I can go look at and figure out uh, uh, what needs to be done, what is expected, what isn't expected. So um, it's a very, very good tool and very useful tool that I like to use. I will say one thing, um, it's sometimes auto-generated and sometimes it's manually generated. And when stuff are manually generated, we need to think about how accurate they are. Um, the third point is how we're going to run stuff locally. Um, so companies usually do one of two things, either having this huge environment, local environment where they run everything. Um, that usually doesn't last that long because microservices tend to get complicated quite fast. Um, and then you're starting to see shared development environment, maybe in your cloud provider. Uh, I personally use AWS and I have dev environments there. Um, and then you have shared environment in your cloud um, that all of your uh, uh, developers start to use. Um, it works quite well into a certain extent. So I think we, we, we have fixed those issues. And uh, so we're a few months into microservices, and then for the first time, we have a downtime, right? Something doesn't work in our environment production, um, which, we, which I think it is a good thing because eventually, when you want to test your architecture, when you want to test your code, you want to test that and every decision you made is actually working, you want to see it working in production. And when it doesn't work, this is the time you can uh, start and improve. And after you have a significant traffic on your uh, microservices architecture, usually you learn quite fast that HTTP works uh, um, and it works great. 
when everything is up and running, the minute that you have some service which is unavailable or doesn't do what it should do or has some kind of an issue. So let's imagine that you have service A communicating with service B and now service B is simply not available. So your architecture won't work. And the worst thing, because it's HTTP and it's synchronous, um, the user is going, is going to feel that uh, immediately, but also you are going to have data loss because if service A sent to service B some data uh, um, and service B didn't receive the data, the data is now lost. And data loss is something very, very bad that we should avoid. Um, data is very, very sensitive and we shouldn't lose almost anything. Um, so probably your boss is going to be mad with you and he, he might be right because uh, we could predict that, we could th think about that, that if something is not available, we're going to have some data loss. And you decide that you just hate HTTP. HTTP is not working enough for us um, and, and we need to, to figure out a way to, to fix it. So we don't want to use HTTP because it's synchronous um, and we want to move to something that if one of the components within my architecture isn't available, isn't working, has a serious bug there, I still want the uh, application to be as operational as possible, but more important that I wouldn't lose any data. And this is where you start to see async communication solutions. And you have tons of them. You can use uh, Redis PubSub, you can, you can use RabbitMQ, you can use Kafka. Almost any, any cloud provider has some kind of a distributed queue, uh, sometimes even more than one. I personally use AWS SQS, which is a distributed queue, and I really like this solution. Um, so you have a lot of them. Uh, you just need to pick the right tool for you. So let's, let's see in architectural point of view, uh, how does it look like? So um, we started off with service A communicate with service B and service C. Uh, they communicated directly. And now the way that it looks is service A is going to communicate with service B via Kafka. So I choose Kafka just because everybody likes to say Kafka these days. Um, so service A is going to send the data to Kafka. And what Kafka is going to do is going to take this data, this message, and is going to persist it and is going to make sure that it's not going to, lo to, to be lost. Regardless to service B, what it's going to do, whether it's going to pull this data right now or tomorrow, the data is persistent with Kafka and that's, that's how you solve your data loss issue. So service A would send the data to Kafka and service B would pull the data from Kafka when it's available. So, it's actually making your architecture a bit more complicated. Um, and, but, but as you look at it here, it's not that too complicated. So now our data is persistent and that's good. But one thing that we may all already learn that we have kind of a mileage in microservices and we kind of understand that every choice that we make has both pros and cons, not particularly in microservices, in general in tech, that's, that's what happens. So we can start think about what are the problems with asking ourselves. So let's, let's start to, to, to ask the, the question. So first of all, we talked about Swagger, um, which did the documentation in the HTTP world for us. Um, now that we move to something else, some async solution, we don't have Swagger anymore because Swagger is particularly describing HTTP communication. So now we need to figure out a different way to visualize that. Because HTTP is very common, is been here for a, a lot of years and everybody uses HTTP one way or another, um, it has a big ecosystem, ecosystem and very mature solutions. Because the async world is uh, um, very split and there is a lot of uh, options out there, you're probably not going to find a very uh, uh, community-adapted big solution that has 
a mature solution with uh, a lot of ecosystem and open source around it. So the, you may find a solution kind of like Swagger for whatever tool you choose to do your, your offing solution, but it's probably going to be less mature and less adopted. So that's a thing that you need to think about, but it's not that complicated to find a solution. The second thing that I'm going to talk about is, is kind of more complicated. Um, now we have, uh, uh, um, we have to run the thing locally. And the reason I said that we need to run it locally is because if we have a shared environment, um, it's going to raise some problems. So let's circle back to what we said that we're going to do. So we had few services and we may deploy them on some cloud environment that is shared between services. So if I'm a developer and I'm working on service A, I'm working it on, on, on the service A locally and I'm communicating with service B uh, that is located in some cloud environment. That should work and there is no problem with that. So now let's assume that I'm working with service B um, and service B pulls data from Kafka. So the Kafka thing is deployed on the cloud environment and service B is deployed on my local environment. And now I want to populate my, my service, um, service B, with some data in order to test it, in order to debug it, in order to develop it. Now I need to send data to service B. So I can't actually really use the Kafka solution in my cloud environment because there are other resources who are going to pull the data from it. So if I'll send a message to it, I don't know who will consume this message. It might be my service. It might be some other instances in the cloud or some other developer. So it's making it a bit more complicated. So I probably need to think on a creative solution, like running Kafka locally, like not pulling the data from Kafka in my local environment, but just to send the data directly to it. So it's a complicated uh, uh, place. Um, and it's very, very much related to breaking changes because if it's hard for me to develop something, it's hard for me to send the right data, um, the chances that I will make some breaking change increases. So it's very, very much depend on your environment and how you're working locally. Um, I personally, at this point, really, you really like to use Docker Compose in my local environment. That way I know I have a contained environment that I can control and I try to reduce the amount of resources that are not in, in my local environment. So that, that is, a, 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 is a big point that we need to think about. The third thing is kind of related to, to, to the second is uh, it's harder to debug a service uh, that pulls data because when we used HTTP, we ran the service locally and send a request to the API it's in a tool like Postman. Uh, now we can't do that because the service pulls data and doesn't receive data. Um, so that's another obstacle to overcome. But the biggest concern that I have, because all the three above that um, are solvable one day, one way or another, the ability to see the bigger picture as your microservices increases and you're starting to do async com uh, communication gets really, really complicated. Um, just to give you a sense how it looks, so we can start to have all kinds of Kafka messages running through my services. Um, and this is where things start to get messy. If, if you look at the left side of, this, of the screen versus the right side of the screen, you can see where we have Kafka and where we don't have Kafka, and it just looks like a mess. So it's not that my presentational skills <laughs> are that bad, but I did want to show you how complicated it could look. It's really hard to even look at that. That means that it, you get the idea where, where how the, the, the architecture looks when you have 20, 50, or 100 services. You just can't figure it out. You just can't think of the whole architecture. And, we, and you can't think of the whole architecture and you can't describe it and you can't draw it on your whiteboard um, this is where breaking changes are really, really risky. This is one of the major things that I want to show you that, that we can actually solve. We can solve it and 
we have the, the right tools for that. So the tool for that is doing distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is basically the ability to trace how uh, microservices communicating with one another. If I would have something that based on the actual traffic that is running between my services, something that collects the traffic, analyze it, and report to this central server that will give me the ability to see the flows in my architecture, it would be amazing. It would make my life as a, de as a developer much, much easier. So there are a few solutions out there, and I'm going to talk about one in particular. I'm going to talk about a tool called uh, Open Telemetry. So Open Telemetry is an open source tool that basically uh, allows you to uh, um, instrument distributed traces in microservices. Um, it's by CNCF. CNCF is a, the Cloud Native Computing uh, Foundation. It's the same foundation that uh, develops Kubernetes. So it's kind of a serious and, and uh, a respectable project, and I really like it. Um, the way that it works is that you implement some library in your code. So in your code, you just implement a library. I'll show you an example in a second. It's very, very simple, very straightforward. Um, and basically, it's within the code, it's going to instrument what data comes into a service and what data goes out to a service. And that way, it's able to describe uh, the entire flow in your, uh, in your architecture. So just to give you a, a quick example how it looks, this is uh, uh, the JavaScript library. There is a bunch of them. You can use all of those programming languages. So you have almost everything that you're looking for. In JavaScript, which is uh, my favorite language, I use uh, Node.js. Um, this is what you need to do in order to instrument your application. Just express uh, which plugins you want to use. Um, and you just do like few lines of code and you're up to up to speed. Everything is being sent to a central location. Um, and the central location, I personally use uh, Jaeger. Uh, there is also Zipkin. Those are the two main uh, central servers that knows how to ingest the traces. But more importantly, they know how to present it in your UI. So we can look here, and this is a trace um, from a specific microservice, the Aspecto API Analytics, one of the services, and it has a, a, a slash get accounts uh, endpoint. And as you can see here, you can see a diagram of who is communicating with who and all kinds of metrics around that. Um, and you can also see it in a timeline manner where you can understand which and which action took how how long. So API analytics communicating with something called privacy config and um, privacy config communicating with AWS to get some parameter. And eventually uh, we ran some uh, uh, query in MongoDB um, to fetch some data. So it's very easy to understand for a particular endpoint what was the outcome, what actual component, what was the relation, and what actions were uh, occurred due to this API call. For me as a developer, the ability to inspect this data, understand it, uh, imagine that I clicked one button and now I want to visual all the flow and every uh, uh, data component within within that flow, it's, it's very, very easy to do that. Uh, one important thing to say that you can have this trace ID. This trace ID, you can basically just throw it here and find the, the trace ID, find the trace based, based on the ID. And, <clears throat> and what, you, what you can do with that, um, basically you can write logs into your log solution. And when you write logs, you can add the log ID, the trace ID. So if you now have some issue, if something failed, if you're now inspecting a log and you don't understand how this uh, line of code was executed and you want to know 
what endpoint executed it, you can just grab this trace ID, put it in Jaeger UI or Zipkin or whatever, uh, paste it and search on that. And now you're going to get the entire flow and how uh, uh, between microservices, uh, uh, which message were sent and what was invoked and what was not invoked. Seeing the bigger picture has a direct impact on reducing the amount of bugs reaching production. So OpenTelemetry Jaeger, Jaeger is going to help you with visualizing a flow. It's going to help you with uh, uh, debugging only if you uh, uh, make sure to write the trace ID um, whenever you can. Um, I personally uh, uh, did a, a kind of a solution where no matter what you do, every log entry has a trace ID. That's why it's super easy for me to debug stuff. And most importantly, understanding the big picture. A developer who makes an impact must know the bigger picture, the bigger impact of what it what is doing. It's not going to help you with local development, which is kind of a problem in that area. It's not going to help you run uh, 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 decide which test you need to write, um, which is kind of an issue with microservices. And it's not going to help you to reproduce an issue. It's got, just going to give you the flow, but not the actual data to reproduce a, a specific flow. So just to think about what we went through, we started off with small microservices. We started off with some HTTP communication. We moved to async communication, and we managed that we wouldn't lose any data. Um, that introduced challenges in understanding the bigger picture, which we solved by doing uh, traces, dis distributed traces, uh, creates this big architecture diagram um, that for us as developers, uh, um, we can now see the bigger picture. And um, we didn't find a specific Swagger replacement, but as I said, you're probably going to find something in that area, so it's not a big issue. One of the biggest things that for me, it's, uh, it's very um, complicated is how to do micro uh, tests in microservices. So you could do unit test, which is great and good, but it's not really helpful in the microservices area. Uh, because I want to be able to know if I'm going to do any kind of a breaking change. To do that, I can use API tests and I can use all kinds of tests, but it's very hard to find the right uh, uh, test in microservices. What should I test? What data should I provide in order to reproduce a, a good coverage of the use cases in production? So this is something that is quite complicated. Uh, I think it's a must-have uh, thing to do in microservices. Companies usually invest mostly in monitoring their production and doing a lot of logs. Um, and it's they are uh, uh, working less on tests because it's very, very complicated. Um, but I think it is important. I personally think companies should invest there a bit more. Uh, by the way, that's my because I think that that's what my uh, company focuses on. Um, but this is something that I don't feel it's very, very, uh, it doesn't have a very, very good solution. So I, I just want to, to share a thought with you um, that I think microservices, by definition, are complicated and are getting more and more complicated as you invest more in them. Um, the reason being is those are microservices. They're very small. They have one responsibility or very few responsibility, which means that there, there, is going, there are going to be a lot of them. The more you progress, the more services you're going to have. The more services you're going to have, you're going to have more complexity. And that's, defini that's the definition. Our, our role as developer is to predict that, be ready for that, and bring the right tools to, to, to overcome those issues. Oh, another thing that makes it complicated is that um, once you're getting more mature in microservices, you're starting to realize that you can use the right tool for the job. If it's a specific database for a specific issue, a specific programming language for a specific feature, um, and then you started to have all kinds of solutions uh, um, for, for a specific microservice, you should be aware of that, that uh, some of the solutions you implemented are uh, uh, programming language specific, 
Um, so be aware if you're introducing a new programming language for one specific microservice, it should uh, uh, be included in your bigger ecosystem. So this is why I really like OpenTelemetry because they have support for a lot of programming languages. I would use HTTP where I have to, but where I can, I would use async communication. It's way better, it's way safer, um, it puts your mind at ease during production. It does make development a bit more complicated. I hope I helped you to see uh, the problems and issues, the challenges microservices introduce. Uh, and I also hope I gave you some ideas to uh, uh, solutions. Um, I'm, I will be very, very happy to get an email from one of you asking a question. I will be happy to try and help you if I could. Uh, thank you so much for attending.